like I said, I have pre-event anxiety um, where I have to talk myself from the ledge. Um, you know, you're okay. You can do this. You are a capable woman. Like I have to tell myself that. Hey everybody, welcome to Blushing Phoenix. I'm April and on this channel, I help you understand that you can live your best life even if your skin turns red. Today, I have an interview for you that you are going to love. I'm meeting with a young woman named Bailey from Arizona who struggled with addiction, with substance abuse, alcohol in particular, for 15 years. I'm happy to say that Bailey is now in recovery and sober for two years, but she's gonna share some of her story about how she started to cope with her blushing by using alcohol and other substances. And if you're not wanting to hear a message of hope today, then this won't be the video for you. But hopefully you're wanting to feel empowered and feel that you can conquer the world. That's the message you're gonna get from Bailey because that is her story. I'll let her tell you herself. Hey, if you like the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe. And without further ado, Bailey, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, April. Hi, Bailey. Nice How to How are you? I know <laughs> you too. So good to see you. Let me, I'm going to connect. I ran away from my computer while I go and it undid my earbuds. I'm going to connect them. Okay. Yeah. I know the struggle. It's a, uh, it's lawn day, which I forgot about. So I have my work headset. So <laughs> It's all good. Sometimes I send out that thing that's just like, here's some tips and how we can make this go a lot smoother. But at the end of the day, this is just life. I, my kid is doing virtual school, like right down the hall. So he was yelling out, mommy, while he go. And I was like, ah! but then, um, <laughs> and then the laundry room's right next to me and our, <laughs> I can change the setting, but our dryer, when it goes off, it like sings this little tune for like, yeah. it feels like 10 minutes straight. So I was like, let me go ahead and turn that off just in case. But the oh really great gosh. thing about recording and video editing is that I can always just I can always edit it out or if something crazy nice. happens, I can be like, let's time out. We'll go back and ask that question again. But other than that, I yeah. really like people to see it really raw and real. And if you've seen any of the interviews before, you kind of know how they're going to go. So it's Absolutely. really just comfort conversation. And I think people appreciate more of that anyway. Just I agree. <laughs> yeah, I love, I, yes, all of your interviews are super helpful. So yeah, thanks for everything you do for sure. <laughs> oh, awesome. Thank you for just volunteering to be able to tell about your story. I think that was one of the things when I saw in your uh, message, you said that, uh, let's see, you said, although terrifying, <laughs> you know, that's what, what most people will say when they're, when I say, does anybody want to do this? Would you be willing to do this? Or when I ask people directly, they're like, that is terrifying. But for some reason, you just feel like you have to, you need to share. Always. Tell people. Yeah. Yeah. So, what I'm going to do is um, I've just, like I said, I just took a little bit from your note that you shared with me because you don't have a heavy online presence of like things that you're talking about and doing, but mm -hmm. this is such a huge topic. And um, I don't know if I've shared this here on the channel, but in my personal life, I actually was in the behavioral health field for a few years working at an addiction treatment center. I worked at the corporate office that helped put people into treatment. So mm -hmm. it's really... Um, something that is really dear to my heart, people who have been through the struggle. I've, you know, cried with people, celebrated with people, watched people relapse and go back in. And even, even in that is something that, um, you know, I think people look at even the relapse as like, oh, I messed up and I got to start all over. But when you realize that's actually just a part of life sometimes too. So yeah. you, I learned so much in that, in that realm and also just how ignorant I was prior to being there and seeing and hearing and knowing the ins and outs. It's not a stereotype. There's not just a stereotype of what that looks like. There it's mm. real human beings. It's corporate executives, it's fathers, it's mothers. It's, you know, it's not just what we would think of like someone who's addicted or an alcoholic. So I'm really right. excited to dive into this conversation with you because I think people yeah. are looking for a way to cope, especially with something that creates so much insecurity <sighs> and how do no. I deal with it? There doesn't seem to be a lot of answers. So just kind of to give an intro to uh, when I post this, you mm -hmm. are Bailey and you had reached mm -hmm. out to share with me that you wanted to talk a little bit about your experience with chronic blushing and how you use substance 
you abuse substance in order to be able to cope with that. Addicted for 15 years, didn't really know that until, until towards the end. And you have been yep. sober for two years at this point. Yes. Awesome. Congratulations to you. <laughs> Thank so you so much. You. So if you don't mind, Bailey, will you just take us into, I mean, just me, me and you here and everyone else to watch just how that happened where, when you started blushing, just whatever you want to share that led into kind of your heightened moment to your down moment to where you are now and you've you've got the floor we're in no rush and you just go right ahead okay yeah absolutely um so you know I I think that I started blushing around like the age where young girls start you know popularity becomes a factor like your breasts are coming in like you know you're in middle school like you know boys are a thing and like um I, I remember uh, at that time I was having heavy um, sweating. I was sweating from my armpits that like, I mean, I would have like, you know, uh, sweat stains on my shirts. And so I think that that was around the same time that like, I really remember like starting to be super uh, uncomfortable in my body, um, you know, around puberty. <laughs> so um I think around that same time I started blushing, um, you know, I remember it was probably like fifth grade. I got called on by a teacher um, and blushed and uh, I just like remember feeling mortified. Um, so it's been the majority of my life um, that that's been an issue. Um, I mean, I have so many, you know, tra honestly traumatic, like you know, memories of mostly in school, um, mostly tied to school. Um, also in my professional life, though, as well. Um, I've been in um, my professional career for 10 years now. Um, and um, I mean, they've, you know, they've asked me to do like uh, unboxings where I'm sitting like in a conference room where I all eyes are on me and I'm just a mess. Like I'm just I'm splotchy and red. I'm sweating. Um, thankfully I did get like, you know, a prescription for, um, dry saw for my sweating. So, um, you know, once I was kind of able to feel more comfortable in clothing, <laughs> I mean, that right. did help. It, it was a little thing. Um, so yeah, you know, just being a kid was super uncomfortable. Um, I hated it. Uh, but so yes, that's really where it started. Um, I think when I had my first, um, uh, interaction with, marijuana I, and drinking, um, I think I was maybe like 14. I was still very young. Um, I'm certain I was like in middle school. It might've been like eighth grade um, going into ninth grade. Um, ninth grade, the summer going into high school um, was when I went to like my first high schooler party. My brother was a senior and I was a freshman. So I, you know, tagged along with him and I had some friends that, you know, were, I, I don't know, I, we weren't bad. Like, you know, we were just, we wanted to party, <laughs> you know, um, you're teenagers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I grew up in a small town um, in Michigan. Um, you know, we were kind of in the middle of nowhere. It was, uh, you know, drinking in the woods, um, drinking at bonfires, um, you know, uh, graduation open houses. So that was my first party. And um, I drank a lot and got really high. And um, I mean, it was just awesome. I loved it. It was so great. Um, and there are even like some really cringy moments that I remember from that night, like, you know, so like that was the start of it. Ugh. And I, I now in sobriety have like a lot of memories that are very um, hard. They're hard to think about for sure. Um, so yeah, anyways, um, yeah, I was in active addiction for 15 years. Um, I really didn't realize that my drinking was not normal. Um, I, I was quite certain that like everyone partied like I did. Um, you know, I, I was a smoker. I smoked cigarettes for a good like seven years. Thankfully, thankfully I've kind of figured out what's bad for me. Like, you know, so I quit smoking. Um, but like, yeah, marijuana, um, alcohol in the past, like in the end of my active addiction, I was, I said to my boyfriend at the time, um, I think I have 
a problem with alcohol like I can't stop drinking like I cannot stop like as much as I want to like it's you know it's a cycle you know you uh wake up in the morning thinking I don't want to drink today but then you get out of work at five o'clock and it's the first thing that comes to mind um so you were very functional you were functioning and then it's like when it's time when work is done it's time yeah, yeah. I was functioning um, and it was, it was a joke. I thought it was funny. I was, oh, I'm a functioning alcoholic, you know, go to the local bar every night, drink four IPAs, which, you know, high alcohol content. I wanted to drink the most, you know, the highest alcohol, get the right. fastest buzz, um, you know, and then do it all over again. And I think at the time it was a way of like coping with a stressful job. Um, when it started to get really bad, um, you know, um, but yeah, it was, uh, but anyway, so I said to the friend or my boyfriend and he said, well, you don't, you don't have a problem. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess I don't have a problem. I, you know, I don't know. Um, and then, you know, it kind of just started to like, I was like, I don't know, man, like anytime I wasn't with him and I was alone, I was like, getting as drunk as possible because I, I was alone. So I didn't have anyone to kind of see just how, you know, heavily I was like needed the yeah. stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Did you find that with your drinking? Cause it, you, you mentioned something while I go that made me think about uh, my, something in my own personal life. My husband, I have a lot of anxiety period. I've, I'm very ADHD and I just constantly feel like there's a lot of energy inside my body and my husband and I got these electric bikes. I love them. They're amazing. But I told him <laughs> that like last summer when the pandemic first hit, I would get on that bike and I would just be so anxious and so anxious and so anxious. But then there would be nights where we were like having some drinks, you know, just a little buzz, take the edge off. And I could get on that bike and I didn't worry about anything. Like, I don't know if that's considered drinking and driving. It's a bike, but it is electric. <laughs> but I wasn't trapped. It was just enough to like, kind of give you a little buzz to where I would get on that bike and I noticed if I had had some drinks I could get on the bike I would not think about the danger I wouldn't think about getting in getting hit by a car I wouldn't think about sliding on like all the things my brain thinks about like what if I slide on gravel what if this happens what if I get knocked unconscious just to enjoy riding a bike and so I noticed that if I had a couple <laughs> of drinks and then I got on that bike I felt like exhilarated like this is the most fun I'm having I'm not I don't have that worry all over me if anything it was pushed backward is that kind of how it happened for you where it would take that edge off is is that a similar situation to yours yeah yeah absolutely like you know I wouldn't have to think about work I think that that was the the, the biggest one is that I don't know I mean I'm generally like a stressed out person um you know like an anxious person for sure and you know, with like the blushing as well and like the, you know, professional environment and just the pressures of like, you know, having to kind of like be this person that I wasn't sure if I was. And, you know, I'm, I'm 32. So like, you know, I was like still kind of like young trying to climb a ladder and like trying to, you know, show people I was capable and like, you know, prove myself and, um, you know, for sure. Yeah. It was definitely like, you know, have some drinks, um, forget about the day mm -hmm. so you can go and do work again tomorrow. Like right. it was, it was survival really. Yeah. You kind of survived all day long and then you just let it all out and just get into this space of freedom and exhilaration at the end of the day. Did you have situations? Cause it's interesting to talk with someone who was also in the corporate foundation. Cause that was a big thing for me is how do we climb the ladder when we, when we are showing a different story with our body showing that we're not capable, we're panicky, we're anxious, or whatever it is that they believe. And then we perceive that story back because we already think they're thinking this. Um, <laughs> did you have those situations in your corporate life uh, prior to getting sober where people would point it out or say, why are you so red or what's going on with you? You know, yeah, there were definitely a few people, um, you know, I mean, no one ever really made me feel bad about it, but I would you know, certain little like clicks in the company I would stay away from because I knew that they were a little bit more like, ah, ha, ha, you know, ha, ha. like they'd pick yeah. on each other, like make fun of, you know, it was like the camaraderie of that made me terrified. And I was like, Ooh, no, I'm not, I can't, right. um, insert myself into like being 
friends with them really, you know, or like, um, you know, cool coworkers. Like, so I, yeah. I very much like, you know, at the time kept a, a professional face. Um, I, I tried not to get too personal with a lot of my coworkers because I was afraid. Um, so, but yes, no one really made me feel bad. Um, I definitely had some blushing moments. Um, oh, you know what though? I mean, a lot of the, um, people who did kind of, they poked fun at me, you know, um, like, oh, let's, you know, see, I can make her turn red by just saying this, yes. or, you know, because they don't realize what they're doing. They really do think it's like, when I've had people do that, I had a boss one time. And I think that's why in a lot of my videos or a lot of my, uh, Instagram uh, videos, I'll say, I'm just got through flushing, but I just got to talk to my boss because I had a boss that traumatized me. You were talking about like things in your childhood that are trauma traumatizing that we know it's not always watching somebody die or having some major, huge, big thing happen. Trauma can be embedded into your nervous system over what others would consider as little things. So I know I've been in an environment where somebody says something or they embarrass somebody and they're like, oh my gosh, look at how red he just got. And I cringe yes. in the inside because I'm like, you don't even know you might, it could, it may have not bothered him at all. But in my mind, I'm like, oh my gosh, I would panic if they just said that to me. But I did have a boss that got me to flush one time. It was just in normal conversation. He got, I got warm and he said, yeah. did I just upset you? And I, and I said, no, why? And he said, cause you just got it all red and splotchy. And <sighs> then I, I immediately was like, he, he sees me already. And this is my boss. This is where any level of um, you know, gaining any momentum in my career is going to come from him. And he just saw this and then he thought it was funny. So he started laughing. So I kind of laughed with him. And then oh. every time I would see him after that, he created like a brain pattern for me. Cause every time I would see him after that, he would go, he would say something and he'd be like, Oh, there it goes. You're starting to splotch again. And it started happening every time I saw him because he created the story in my mind. I, I grasped onto a story that I oh. created that I let him create that put that into my nervous system. So then I noticed when I went to my next job, every single time I talked to my boss, which was a totally different person, but he was a person <laughs> of authority, it created the, br the brain loop again, which is why I like to oh talk a lot gosh. about flushing and erythrophobia, but also what is the story we've told ourselves about it and how can yeah. we undo that? So yeah, when people poke or make fun, they, I don't think they mean to do, they don't know what they're doing. And that's part of like having these conversations is, is letting people know stop doing that. Please stop yeah. doing that. Or if <laughs> Please, we yeah. are going to do it, how are we going to handle it? Or what do we do to go decompress, you know, afterwards to get it right. out of our system? Oh my so, gosh. yeah. I'm, I'm telling you, it's so wild. I did not, I would <sighs> look at pictures of me prior to about five years ago where I would wear really low neck shirts. And I was like, did I really go to work like that? And, and I never splashed. I think I did from time to time, but I just don't think I cared. And then once that started becoming like, it's a big deal. And mm -hmm. I realized it was a big deal. And somebody was kind of making fun of me, which is our childhood. That's our childhood fear is that you're going to notice something wrong with me. Something's different about me. And you're going to call me out for it. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, uh, like your story, starting when you were younger and hitting puberty, it starts there and it creates this <sighs> narrative for ourselves. So when you got to the place yeah. of realizing I've got a problem, um, <laughs> what was your first step in, in really, what were your next steps after that? And, and just what was going on in your mind with, I think I have a problem and I need to get some help. Um, can you walk us through that part of your story? Yeah. So I started talking about it. I started saying to people, um, my close friends first, I said something like, I don't know, we were talking about drinking and I was like, you know, I can't stop. Like literally I, I cannot stop drinking. Um, I drink every day. I, you know, and they're like, and one of my friends just casually said like, Oh, have you ever thought about going to AA? And I was like, no, like, you know, um, and then, it, uh, you know, months, I mean, months went by and I kept saying, you know, I can't stop drinking. Um, one of my close friends said, you know, I, I talked about it with him. He said, you know, that sounds rough. Um, maybe you, you, you know, should get some support. And I was like, I don't know what to do, you know? <laughs> and he had a friend who was sober, um, who was two years sober. And he put me in contact with her. Um, she reached out to me. Uh, she was in the AA program. Um, so I met her for my first AA meeting and it was kind of like a, you know, I had my last drink the night before. Um, 
you know, I had the, the, the last beer and um, my best friend has a son and um, he was, I think maybe like one and a half, two at the time. But that night I had, you know, drinking my, my two beers, you know, getting prepared to go to AA the next day. And he gave me a hug and a kiss. And like, you know, I knew my breath smelled like booze and it was kind of just this, like, it just washed over me. Like, you don't want to be known as like, you don't want to be associated with that smell for him, you know? Um, and, um, you know, yeah. So thankfully I, I just talked about it and, and I'm really glad that I had, you know, supportive friends who kind of, you know, they weren't drinkers like me, um, which I never realized really, you know, yeah. um, but once they had their kid and, you know, they started to kind of settle down, I was like, you know, I can talk to them and, and they were really supportive. So I went to AA. Yeah, that's amazing. And that's something that just having that, and it really ties in with blushing altogether, regardless of whether it's substance abuse, it's anything else that we're turning to, to help us escape or help us feel a certain way or help us. And, you know, I think a lot of people, they, there's a stigma around a lot of different things. So if people turn to shopping, it's funny and it's shopping therapy. If people turn to eating, then it's, oh, you know, that's just what we do when we're stressed. We eat, a, a, you know, a whole pint of ice cream. But when it turns to alcohol or any other sort of substance, it becomes this massive thing of, you know, oh man, you're in a downward spiral. And really you're just clinging to something like anybody else would. And I think that was a big thing for me when I worked in um, the substance abuse tre treatment and behavioral health around that was that it's like, we're, we're all very similar in what we're doing. It's just what we're clinging to. That's a little bit different when you yeah. got into, and you got sober. And then you said to me that you had, um, opened up with someone in a women's support group, or you've been talking about blushing and such. Yeah. What, how did that go for you to be able to talk about your blushing? Oh my goodness. So I am, Oh, I'm just beyond privileged. Um, I, during COVID, it was uh, right when lockdown happened. Um, this group that I follow on Instagram called She Recovers posted, hey, we're going to start doing, um, you know, daily twice meetings. Um, it's, a, it's just a women's group. And I was at that time, you know, I was just going to AA, um, all the meetings had shut down. So we went online there, and that, and I always had like a little eh, hesitation with AA. There was always kind of like a, a sense of like not belonging. Um, so I went to this women's group and um, I mean, I just kept going and going and like it just, the, the space um, felt so welcoming. And then um, I'm not even really sure what prompted me. Um, well, Actually, no, it was around January of this year. I, I moved to Phoenix. I live in Arizona now. Um, and I searched erythrophobia on Reddit and like the internet. And I started doing all of this research on it. And I found, you know, you and, and the Soulful Taws. I saw her video um, and, um, and then the Reddit support group. And then, you know, and then I just recently found I blush um, on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of just like, this is all recent that I'm like, I cannot live like this anymore. Like I cannot live with this feeling. It's awful. Like I, I, I it's, it's not, it wasn't holding me back. Like I took, you know, this promotion with work where they wanted me to do presentations and stuff. And I was like, oh my yeah. God, like, I can't, I can't, you know, um, <laughs> terrifying but people had they believed in me my coworkers believed in me to do this job you know so um so I was just like so so lucky to like find the support and when I saw that so many other people experienced what we do I was like oh my god like I don't feel so alone so then I I posted on my she recovers Facebook group and I said you know what everybody the reason I'm here because of my alcohol use disorder is because of this deep down fear of blushing. I'm, a, I'm an excessive blusher. My face blushes. I, I turn blotchy and splotchy. You know, I'm nervous. I have generalized anxiety disorder. I have social anxiety. Like I can't, I can't live, you know, <laughs> like, like I'm doing, I'm trying like, and I'm just, this is awful, you know, um, I'm, I'm looking for support. Um, I found support. I want to be honest with you all and let you know exactly what I really am struggling with. And it's this, and you, April, you wouldn't believe I had, I swear to God, it was like 
30 comments on this post that were like, me too. Oh my God. I blush too. Oh my gosh. Like I used to blush as a younger woman. Now I've, you know, gotten better, you know, and a lot of people supporting. I had one person say, oh, you know, um, kind of give me the childhood support, you know, for my, my internal child, like, um, you know, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Oh, it was the sweetest. Like everyone was so supportive, not one person or, you know, people were like, oh my God, I never knew that that was a thing. I'm so sorry. You've dealt with this your whole life. Like, thank you for bringing awareness to it. Um, wow. and since then I've, I've been able to say on my group meetings, Hi, I'm Bailey. I'm in recovery from alcohol use disorder. Um, I've recently added erythrophobia and the fear of blushing and excessive blushing and some childhood little T trauma, you know, just some some really tough memories. Um, And what's so cool about this group as well is it's not just women in recovery from alcohol use or substance use. It's intergenerational trauma. Um, Geez, you know, I have the list and it's just eating disorders, um, codependency, uh, trauma, love or sex addiction, burnout from overworking or or caring for family members, um, shopping addiction, cancer, other illness, grief and loss. Like it's, it's everything. Like, so it's just a group where these women are just, my heart explodes because I've, I've just, I've grown in sobriety because of them. And because of the support I've gotten online from the erythrophobia support groups. And like, I'm, things are like, I'm seeing the gifts. Mm. (laughs) I'm seeing the gifts of sobriety after two years and I'm working really hard to deal with some of the the stuff. So it's just incredible. Like I I'm sometimes in disbelief of it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Is that group, is that a private group or is, can anybody join that group or how, how can people get to, to that? Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a women's group. Um, unfortunately men are are not, um, you know, provided access, but, um, yeah, we, we, uh, we accept any woman, um, who's in recovery from anything, um, or just needs, you know, women supporting women. Um, so it's, uh, it's online at sherecovers.org. Okay. I'm definitely going to add that into the description box because I think that's something that's really huge for everybody. I think coming together and being able to talk about here's, here's who I am. Here's what I struggle with. And, you know, it's interesting when you give an introduction to yourself to say, I'm April, meaning this is who I am, but here's what I've got that comes along with me, or here's what I've overcome, or here's what I'm overcoming. And I think there's some things in our life, we're going to spend our whole life constantly moving through it, not in a sense of, I feel like back in the day, that would be really disheartening for me to be like, I'm going to struggle with this for the rest of my life. But I also think that, especially with urethrophobia, with chronic blushing, it comes down to, I feel like I had a really great day. And then if I blush again, or I flush, I feel like I failed. And so that to me was this kind of like game of cat and mouse constantly, like today, like I'm flushing really bad right now, but (sighs) I'm 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 more comfortable on this interview with you than I am on the interview that I'm going to upload today where oh. I'm like super ADHD and the, I, I just felt really like really amped and like I hadn't had enough time enough sleep and Dr. Tara's who I met with on that one she was fantastic and she made me feel comfortable but I could feel in my body that I wasn't like more I wasn't as calm and wasn't as centered and then I noticed as we're talking because I could see myself in the viewfinder that I could see the splotches happening and I'm like That is so bizarre because I don't feel, I feel really calm in my system today. And Uh this right here is what would make somebody just come unraveled because they would be like, but I, I feel so calm today. Why is this happening? I'm like, this is just part of what will happen sometimes, whether, and I don't always have to try to figure it out. When I started off the channel, I know it was like, is it my menstrual cycle? Is it this? Is it this? And it's like, yeah, yes. Yes, all the things, but also, <laughs> but also, I don't know, but I also know that I want to continue to be able to have conversations with people like you and meet people like you. I also know in this environment, you understand, so I don't feel judged and I don't feel like insignificant and insecure. So that doesn't make this add up to why it happens when, I, when I'm with authority figures or people who hold that power. So I think when it comes down to, you know, this is, I'm April 
he, this is something you might see when we interact sometimes and sometimes you may not. And it's just that sense of acceptance. And that's what I hear you saying about the support group that you found is that no matter what you have going on, that people just came around you and the outpouring of me too. That's what I found with this channel it, and just talking about erythrophobia period was I didn't think anybody knew because you can't find a lot of research out there. But now more people like yourself are starting to connect and open up and share more of these deep, vulnerable things between, you know, I'm a chronic pleasure or I have abused alcohol and you're, but, but you're still accepted. And it sounds like that's what you found there is that Bailey, we still see you. That's okay. And we're going to, we're all going through something period and we're here to support you. And that definitely what I'm hearing you say. Exactly. It's like, it, my heart explodes from the support that I get from that community. So That's yes, amazing. it's pretty so wonderful. Recovers.org. Sure. Yes. Um, and it sounds like too, when you put yourself out there to share about your blushing experience, that it sounds like you found some, um, like you found me, you found, maybe you said I blush was recent, but you found some other places where people were talking about it, which then gave you the strength to say, I want to share this in this group and see what happens. So leading exactly. up to that, was it like, I can't believe I'm sharing this or what was, what was your experience about posting it out there? Oh, yeah, I was pretty nervous about it for sure. I was like, oh my God, like, you know, cause I don't, some people don't like, it doesn't click, you know, um, or they don't think about it or it's, you know, it's, I, I just, and it, for me, it's hard to explain um, exactly what comes along with, with the blushing. Um, I mean, you and, um, soulful Taz, I can't think of her first name, but the, the Laura. videos that you've done. Oh my gosh. She's amazing. I saw your, your interview with her too, by the way. And like, so all, all of the stuff that people have, you know, been able to put words on, on the emotions that are attached to blushing, um, has kind of helped me understand, you know, those feelings as well. Um, and, you know, again, I've had like the privilege of having health insurance and being able to get, seek therapy as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, I am with a regular therapist. Um, currently, we're, we're digging into to some of the little T traumas, um, you know, that are associated with my blushing. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, absolutely. It's just so people who support it and, and talk about it makes me want to talk about it. And, you know, when I did, like, when I've shared it in a meeting, like I've had, you know, women support me and like, you know, I'm like, Oh my God, thank you. Like I'm, you know, my heart is beating through my chest right now. And they're like, Oh, don't worry. Like you're going to be doing a Ted talk here soon. You know? So <laughs> when I get that support, it's like, really, I'm like, Oh my God, like, you know, let's keep talking about it. I want to keep talking about it. Tell it, shout it from the rooftops. <laughs> right. It's really a speaking out. Am I safe here? Do I belong here? Do I matter? And all the pieces of me, not just when I'm put together or when I'm, you know, I'm a good speaker or writer, or I'm good at a craft or a gifting that I have is all of me accepted. And I think the more we're talking about it, the more we realize it's like this sense of relief. When you said like 30 people or so came through and was like, me too, or, you know, <laughs> or I used to, and I'm so sorry. Yeah, you know, I may, I may not really fully understand how someone can struggle with it, but I see you and I thank you for sharing that. And I'm sorry that you ever had to go through that. We kind of get this, like, that's it. Okay. I can do this again. <laughs> and yeah, that's yeah. the exposure therapy, which is a huge part, I think, of moving through erythrophobia. The interesting thing about Laura, so soulful Taz, in my interview with her, which, which you said you listened to, was what I found so crazy was that she said she actually doesn't blush a lot. It's just she's afraid she will blush. And so hearing <laughs> that perspective was like, whereas like for me, it's, it's going to, ha it's more rare that it doesn't happen to me, even though it's not on my face, it's more on my chest mm -hmm. and neck. But it's one of those things where, um, to hear somebody say, I actually don't blush a lot, but because she's had a traumatic experience with it or traumatic experiences with it, the idea that it could happen again. And then I look at her and I'm like, you? Cause I just think she's like the queen. Like she's so amazing. And when she's I so look, cool. <laughs> listen to her and I'm like, well, okay then if, if, if 
like Laura's that way. So Paz can be that way and still get on her channel and do her thing. And yeah, I, then I just feel very empowered myself. So we were almost like we're climbing this ladder together, uh, arm in arm, hand in hand, and realizing that not only are we all in this together as chronic blushers with urethrophobia or whatever else we have going on, but there's also people around us that don't even understand it at all, but they still support us. I, I'm going to mm. do a video on this soon, but um, I had a conversation with my mother-in-law yesterday. So the first time I've been married to my husband for 15 years, we've been together 16 years. And for the first time I shared with my mother-in-law about the channel, she knew nothing about it. And I talked oh to gosh. her about, you know, my experience with skin flushing and urethrophobia. And she, she was so blown away by, wow, I've, I never even noticed that on you. And she said that she used to have a boss that did it, that would flush a lot. And she said, I would, I wouldn't really think anything about it. I would see it happen to her. And I would think, man, why is she turning so red? Maybe she's just nervous. And then she said, and then I would just move on. I never thought anything else about it. And so hearing that from the outside, from somebody who doesn't necessarily understand it, but is like, huh, interesting. I've seen that before on people and I don't even see it as a big deal. It's just part of being human, I guess. And and especially on fair skinned people. So hearing that, because the more we're having conversations, the more we're getting it out from the inside. It sounds like that with your substance abuse too. And with the alcohol, you just started talking about it. And once you started talking about it, it led you to a next place, to a next place. And now you're two years sober. You found this amazing Mm. support group. You're dealing with some childhood traumas, blushing and all of those things. So Um, I mean, that's just honorable. It's so honorable, Bailey, with what you've done with yourself and identifying number one, I need to do something different. Yeah. And it's not stopping you in your career either. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Oh my gosh, April. Well, thank you so much. And that's like that. This is something that I've kind of like gathered from your channel and like your videos is that, and this is in, in my heart as well. Like I, I've never wanted blushing to hold me back. Um, I mean, it has, uh, you know, I can't think of like a specific example, but like, it's always been in the back of my mind. Like when my work came to me and said, um, you know, my boss at the time said, um, I would like you to be a product specialist and go and do presentations and talk about our product to our resellers and distributors and all of that. And I was like, oh God. (laughs) Like, I can't believe you're asking me to do that. Like, I mean, my heart just sinks and I'm like, I I can't do that. I can't, there's no way. Like I'm, you know, I want to be behind a desk. I don't, (laughs) don't look, don't look at me, you know? Um, Yeah. So, but they were so supportive and, you know, I kind of shared all of these concerns about, you know, being nervous and like this and that. And, you know, despite always kind of being like a bubbly, like, oh, ha ha ha, you know, um, type of sociable person I have I have always had the fear of blushing I've always had you know it's it's always the forefront on my mind like um you're gonna blush uh and then what are you gonna do like kind of um catastrophizing catastrophe yeah oh yeah is that, is that a word okay mm-hmm. <laughs> so and that's not how we're making it up it's gonna be <laughs> one so yeah yeah catastrophizing yeah, I'm gonna that's blush and then the world is gonna end <laughs> right it becomes a very <laughs> catastrophic event it is it is majorly yes. like part of the thing with the CBT is that I don't know if you've been through any CBT before but it's it's very much like what's the worst that's gonna happen and then you put yeah. your mind into that you know, what's the most, the worst thing, like you said, the world is going to end and we're like, no, it's not. So what else is the worst thing that's going to happen? And, and then you kind of walk yourself through that. So, and is that something you are actively doing that you, you are doing the product stuff. And I know you said you guys went virtual, but then you would go back into the office. Um, yes. soon. So you're oh having my gosh. to be front and center, doing- which is anybody's fear, I think. <laughs> No, yes. My therapist says it's normal to be nervous with public speaking, of course, right? It's scary. Um, But I've really, you know, with everything I do, I always want to challenge myself to do it despite the blushing, despite, you know, the anxiety pre-event or post-event as well, because sometimes I'll be mortified of like, oh my God, I can't believe like, I felt so, you know, silly when I said this and no one laughed. Oh yeah, so, those moments where you're like, if you read the crowd, you're like, mm, this is not working. This is not working. I remember the first time at uh, the company that um, 
that I always talk about with the boss that makes not, not the one who created the trauma, but the one that triggers it all the time. It has no clue that he did it <laughs> is we were in the office and we had probably about 200 employees at that time. And he said, I want you to speak. I want you to tell about your, um, your book or something like that. And I was like, today, he didn't give me any sort of, uh, tomorrow or <sighs> next week. It was like in 30 minutes. Um, and I was like, okay. And so then I just <laughs> immediately like, I, I'm very much a let's wing it type of person, but you can even see in the message that I sent you of like what to expect. And then I message you again. I want you to know this to give you <laughs> as much of a clear picture as you possibly can have to know what you're walking into and you're not caught off guard. And it kind of settles some of the anxiety around what's about to happen. And mm -hmm. I remember, I, I, so I hate when somebody hits me last minute with, and you're going to speak about something. So I am number one, wondering what my wardrobe is for the day. So I looked down at my clothes and I'm like, okay, because I know I'm going to flush like crazy out there. And then yeah. I just start, like, I go get me a cup of water, lots of ice, and I'm going to hold that in my hand. Like I'm preparing for what this is going to be like to try to keep my body temperature cool to some degree. And then we get out there and we're, I'm speaking to the team. And I, something, I think whenever I start speaking, it's like, it's, I just kind of go somewhere else and whatever needs to come out will just come out. I've just kind of practiced that over the years at speaking events and things where I would try to, um, you know, have all my notes and do it just perfectly. And then one day I tested it just to see what happens if I just show up and start talking. If I just have like three key points and I just talk, what happens? And it was so much better and so much more genuine and real than mm -hmm. if I had all these notes and I realized that I could trust myself. I could trust the gift. I could trust myself to just show up and pour out whatever was what needed to come out in that moment. So then I started um, learning to be more confident in showing up and speaking and doing, you know, whatever needed to be done. But everybody's nervous when everybody's nervous when they speak. But when you show it, it is like, I always felt like it's going to take away from <sighs> the message. It's going to not only right. going to take away from what I'm saying, but it's, then it's going to make them think something of me unlike what I'm trying to portray to them or, or I don't just don't want them to miss the message either and then I started realizing that when I see other people speak and they turn red I notice that I'm hypersensitive to it because I'm like oh somebody else I'm not alone in this yeah but I also same. don't miss out on what they're saying I'm actually just really focused on what they're saying so anyway all that to say I did I did this big thing and I spoke and people were moved by, I don't remember what it was I talked about. Yes. And people were coming up to me afterwards and they were crying. And this was like a Monday morning, like <laughs> wow. Yeah. And people were coming up to me and they were crying. And somebody was like, can I talk to you later? And I had this like grown men, a, a grown man come in my office and just sob about the wow. message that I had shared. And it had, you know, had nothing to do with blushing, but I realized he, they weren't even paying attention to me being read. <laughs> they were so moved by the, the essence of what was being shared. And, and then I started thinking about if I don't use that gift because I flush and I turn red, if I hide because of that, what good is that doing for anybody? And, you know, I, I heard you say that you do it despite you know, turning red and people believed in you and you're being asked to do something. And even though it freaked you out <laughs> tremendously, you're going <laughs> to do it anyway. Um, yeah. And I think that that's a huge thing for the community to know, because I know a lot of people that have messed with me and said, I had dreams of doing this, or I, my boss talked to me about a promotion. There's no way I can do it. What would you say to somebody if they were talking to you and they were saying that to you, like Bailey, you've been so strong and everything that you've been going through but I've, I've got these opportunities to speak or be seen and I just can't. What would you say to, to somebody who says mm -hmm. that? Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, I mean, just like, go for it. You know, like I, cause I thought the same thing. I was like, I'm going to, you know, I, I can't take this job. Right. But I don't know. There was something, you know, that people saw in me that I didn't see. And sometimes, you know, imposter syndrome. I mean, I've dealt with imposter syndrome the majority of my professional career. So I think that, you know, maybe that plays into that, um, you know, as well as blushing. But like, I mean, you know, even if it's like starting small, right? Like you're, you know, you're afraid to blush. Like maybe have like a small team meeting with three people or something, you know, or I don't, I, you know, I don't know. Um, you know, I, 
I had someone reach out to me on Reddit um, that was like, you know, I've just accepted basically that I'm going to be like a hermit for the rest of my life. And, you know, I suggested, well, I mean, can you challenge yourself to maybe like, you know, once a week, go out to dinner with your family, um, you know, people that you're comfortable with that even if you will blush, they're not going to give you a hard time about it, you know, um, or they shouldn't anyways, um, <laughs> if, they're, if they're family and care about you. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, I, so take like baby steps um, if you can, but also like, I think that it's normal for us to doubt ourselves, um, yeah. you know, and, and, trust me, it's not easy to shift that like negative self-talk. It's something that I deal with on the daily. And like, I mean, you know, I, like I said, I have pre-event anxiety um, where I have to talk myself from the ledge. Um, you know, you're okay. You can do this. You are a capable woman. Like I have to tell myself that to, to wake up the next day to, to do the presentation that I've been asked to do, um, you know, and even post like where I'm like, oh my God, that was so embarrassing, <laughs> you know, or whatever, like, it's okay. No one cares. Like no one cares that I stuttered or like, you know, um, even if I do, you know, blush, um, you know, they're going to forget about it in a day. Um, you know, and, and also really like if people give you a hard time about it, I've kind of like learned that that's, you know, I find it very rude. I think that it's like, I wish I could be like, um, excuse me, you know, you, you have no permission to speak about my skin or my body or, you know what I mean? Like right. that's, keep your comments. It's a boundary. Yourself, yeah. Please. Like set a boundary. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, but but when people, you know, say they're, you know, two cents, I'm like, you know, you're, you're not a person that I like want to really be associated with. So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, seriously, because that's somebody, it's just somebody I want to be around that wants to make people feel down and out about something that's going on and not trying to understand. I think that that's something that if, if I see somebody where, you know, they've got a, a rip in their shirt. I'm not going to be like, look at the rip in your shirt. I, mean, I can see your bra. I would be like, hey, come here for a second. You know, I would never try to embarrass somebody. And those are the types of people I want to be around. So I think the same thing comes from blushing. I'm curious to know if on the other side of some of us that are traumatized by our childhood blushing experiences, if um, people who are the ones who do point that stuff out and make fun of it are, um, you know, on the other side of it are just like, oh, I just thought we were we were just having a good time like we do with anything else they don't realize what it does to people so but like you said yeah really it's setting a boundary for yourself and knowing I wouldn't want to want to hang out yes that person did that but that's not somebody I'm going to have in my life so that's not going to happen every time I'm around that person you know yeah. except for me with my old boss and then I would just try to run from him <laughs> just try to run because every time I'd be like, holding my breath around him and I would be like chugging oh. cold water and I'd go in his office he'd be like did I make you mad I'm like damn it it's, it's just gonna happen like you got me you're in my head now <laughs> yeah yeah definitely I mean I've you know it's it's really tough like and it's a daily thing where I'm like you know what I'm I'm a blusher like that's it's a part of me um you know I I don't know I don't know what else to say about it like it's it is a part of me and, and it's really hard to accept myself, um, for that. I, I, you know, I don't feel comfortable in my skin some days. Um, it's really tough, but you know, I don't know. It's like, it's, 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 that's I me. Mean, like that's, you made such a good point when you said it's normal to feel this way. And just hearing you say just so many things you just said, like the imposter syndrome, and even for myself as corporate, corporate executive, been featured in Fortune magazine, have spoken at all these different things, I still feel imposter syndrome. And there's some days where I just feel like on fire, like I feel good about, I feel confident. I definitely have days like that, where I feel very true in my gifts and my talents and everything that I'm showing up to do. And there's other days where I'm like, who am I kidding? Like, I, I still feel like a yeah. five-year-old kid half the time. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that I feel like, that too. <laughs> who put me on a pedestal? Who gave me a stage <laughs> to talk on? And, but I have also known that there's, 
for a huge season of my life, I played really small. I had a lot of gifting and writing and speaking, and I played small because I didn't want anybody to think that I was trying to be something. And so that right there identifies a major issue. I don't want anybody to think. And then I had this woman tell me one time, I was at this like women's event, and I said something about how I, I would blog, but then I wouldn't, this is back in the day when people blogged, I would blog, <laughs> but then, but then um, I would only post it like one time on my social media. I didn't want to constantly repost it because I didn't want people to think that I was trying to gain attention. And this woman who I think she is like a, a head, like a, she was older than me, head of marketing, owned her own company. Um, she did all kinds of promotional things. She was very, I think she wrote a book. She was really strong, strong woman. And she said, uh, stop that in front of all these women she said you stop that like I remember I'm, I probably flushed when she did it because I remember <laughs> being like I just got called out but it right. radically changed my life for the better because she basically said she gave me like a mama talking to she said you stop that and when I realized what she said I kind of like and I know all eyes went on me I was being reprimanded and she said you don't play small for anybody. You have gifts and talents and you've got things inside of you. And if you hold those back, you rob the rest of us. And so, although it was like a traumatic, like I'm getting in trouble by, I'm a grown woman getting in trouble by a grown woman. But I also am still speaking about it to this day because even though I wasn't deeply connected to her, she spoke such radical truth into me. Like stop that shit, stop doing that. And that's what I would want to say to everybody too, is, you know, myself included. So like you said, you have to talk to yourself sometimes and say, you got this. And that's the same thing with me. A few years ago, I was the corporate international human resources manager. Inter I don't know anything about international stuff. And I would show up every day to work and just feel like, do I know what I'm doing? Do I know what I'm doing? And so what I started doing every morning, I would get in the mirror and I would look at myself in the mirror and I would say, you are great at international uh, communications. You are so good at these. And I would speak those affirmations over myself to, to hear me say it so I could believe it. I don't always need some grown woman to tell me, stop that shit, you know, get your, right. get your life together <laughs> and stop holding things yeah. back. But it was so true that the more you shy back, the more somebody else shies back, what are they robbing us of that we need mm -hmm. Um, when we need somebody to speak to us or say something over our lives that could alter us forever for, for the good. And that sounds like that's really a lot of your message is just do it despite what's going on and, and trust it. Yeah. Yeah. Same as you for sure. Like don't play small, take up space. Like we have the right, we are worthy to take up space. Mm -hmm. And like, I know Love that fear, like I'm afraid of my own voice, you know, like, mm -hmm. and that's, that's a daily thing that I'm like trying to work through. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Use it. Use your voice. <laughs> <laughs> I love what you said about, um, you know, testing things on a small scale, go to go with three people, have a meeting with those people. And I, and I also love, and I think it's so true what you said about having conversations about the things that make you feel so scared and overwhelmed. And, if, and for people who blush, especially if they would let themselves be vulnerable, vulnerable enough to do that in a small setting to start letting their nervous system know this is happening, but I'm okay. Like even here talking to you, I've been flushing the whole time and it got worse, but I never have at all felt like fight or flight, I've not felt like yeah. I'm holding my breath. And because I think I've been in these environments enough to know I'm safe here. Um, mm. I definitely see it, but my brain and my mind are starting to have a new story about it. So it's not as debilitating as it would be yeah. back in the day where it's like, it, and plus what better space to flush or blush than in my own <laughs> blushing <laughs> business, which is funny because it's one of those things where I'm like, the more this can happen here, the better, because it shows people in real time this is a real thing. It happens. I actually get excited when it does it because yeah. I'm like, this is what people want to see. They want to see that it happens. They want to know. And I, you know, I've had somebody say to me before, well, then why don't you just wear the low cut shirts? And why don't, I just, I'm not comfortable in those kind of clothing, that kind of clothing anyway, but also, yeah. you know, I'm quick to be like, no, it's happening. It's definitely there. Uh -huh. It's happening. But um, I remember you were talking about talking through things that make us afraid and being with people. Um, when I worked with a PhD psychologist a few years ago, I got on a plane with him. I hadn't been on a plane in a really long time. And he knew I was really afraid of flying because I hadn't been on a plane. And I, and I just, even before that, never really spent a lot of time on planes. So just mm -hmm. like anybody else who nor has normal fear of flying, a lot of people do. I remember right. we were getting ready for takeoff and I was sitting there probably holding my breath. 
And <laughs> as we were preparing to take off, he just started talking to me. So he turned to me and he started talking to me about just something random. And I realized what he was doing is he was trying to help me take my mind off of my, my internal fear. And then because he started talking to me, I was able to voice what I was feeling in that moment as we were taking off on the plane. And the next thing I know, we're up in the air, we're alive, we're okay. But it was so comforting to be able to talk about my feelings and then talk about, you know, what's the most catastrophic thing that's going to happen which, well, that's probably not good on a plane. <laughs> like we're going to crash and die. But, <laughs> yeah, but right. even then, but we did, we talked about it. And, but then we talked about, but how often do we hear that that happens? And it is, mm. is it more safe to be on a plane than it is in a car or vice versa? And just letting yourself hear yourself, it, you validate how you really feel, but you also realize how ridiculous it is on the outside as you're talking about it. So I think that's a big thing. And I love your story of overcoming substance abuse so much of what I've been hearing you talk about is support, you know, recognizing things, processing things and support, 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 and having a place to, when you talked about, you know, I feel like I'm drinking a lot. I can't stop. You you talked about it. And then getting into this, she recovers that or group and talking to them about your recovery, but also I also am dealing with some things from chronic blushing and then people came around to support. So as much as people point and make us feel bad sometimes, it sounds like there's a lot of great people out there too that are willing to receive us with open arms and just take us in. Yeah, absolutely. Like we're, we're special. You know what I mean? Like that's kind of the way that I have tried to shift my thinking around it. Like we're special and we're unique. And I also had someone say to me once like, oh, I think uh, pink and pink and red patchwork is beautiful. So oh. now I, I start to think of like my splotches as patchwork. Like you know, like, it's like, like, I, I think vitiligo is beautiful. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, so it's just kind of like, you know, and, and what about people with acne? Right. You know what I mean? Like everyone has their own skin things, like their own skin conditions, or, you know, if you don't, if you have beautiful olive skin, that's wonderful. Good for you. I'm a little jealous, but also like, I don't know, maybe they have something else, you know? So I, I just, I think we're special and I, I'm just, if I can keep that thought, you know, then, then like I can get through it, you know? And and support though, for sure. I mean, that's huge. I'm, I'm so glad to know that I'm not alone because I thought for so long that I was, Mm -hmm. and that I think was a part of like, what was so debilitating is that I was just like, no one, you know, I just felt so alone. Yeah. And I, I agree about being very special. I think there is something in the people that I've met that have the same condition. There's something so sweet and sensitive inside of them um, with social positive Laura with Hake, I don't know if you watched the interview with him. There's this thing about really strong, empathic people. We're very sensitive, we're very feeling. I'm pretty yeah. sure for some of us, it has to do with some codependency from when we were younger or you know, taking in the environment around us so that we could stay safe in whatever that meant, whether that's something with mom and dad or whatever your, mm-hmm. your life was like as a kid. I think some of us pulled in that energy, but it also made a lot of us very sensitive to what people in the room are feeling so we can we can um, handle people a little differently and a lot yeah. of us express our gifts by giving to people out of that sensitivity and um, I mean I just I have so thoroughly enjoyed this conversation with you I think you are Me just too. such a treasure you I, I was looking through your stuff and I was like normally people will have a little more of a presence of like what's going on with their blushing or or something else that they're doing and I was like you're like a little hidden gem because you've got this <laughs> strong story and you pack a punch but you're there's something special sometimes about people who don't plaster that all over the place and you're just kind of going on about your life and you've got your own things going on and you know and it also shows that you don't always have to be singing from the rooftops that you know this is what's going on you could be a different (laughs) style of personality you can be different in your corporate environment you you know with substance abuse that's a big one and how many people I'm excited to see will connect to this video and connect to you um, and, and probably be able to share more about what they've been struggling with as, as well. Do you mind after the video is posted, if people do reach out to you directly or what are your thoughts about that? Oh, I don't mind at all. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk to anyone who wants to talk about anything, <laughs> like, awesome. you know? Yeah. So I will sure. make sure Thanks your information, asking. your Instagram is in the, um, 
description box or if you have other information that you want to send over to me, email address or anything like that that you would like for people to contact you at so they will know how to get to you directly. And Bailey, in closing, is there anything else that you feel that we missed or in any final words that you would want to say to somebody who lands on this video for whatever reason they clicked on it and they made it this far? What do you want to say to them? about anything. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first, like, thank you for this platform to be able to share my story and, and, and thank you for all that you've done. I mean, seriously, um, I guess, um, you know, I didn't know that there was help. Like, I didn't know that there was support out there um, with blushing and erythrophobia, but also with my drinking um, and substance use disorder. Um, you know, I mean, that, that, AA meeting was a giant church with like a ton of women. And I was just like, oh my God, like, you know, I was convinced that I was going to be drunk and drinking for the rest of my life. Like I was just convinced, like I'm a drinker. I drink. Um, you know, I never thought that there was a sober life for me. I never thought that that was an option. Um, so if there's anyone, you know, that is struggling with substance use disorder or anything, I mean, just know there's so many ways to get support from people who know what you're going through. Um, and even if they don't, I mean, just, I don't know, the more I can speak up and be vulnerable, which I mean, I know it sucks. I, I don't love it, you know, and, and it's taken me a while. Um, you know, I mean, it's taken me two years pretty much of sobriety to kind of build the foundation of like being able to, to speak my truth, um, you know, and, and not hold back. So, um, you know, just, oh, there's just, there's so many people in the world that like want to support people who are struggling with anything. So um, whatever it is, just like, you know, you're not alone. You're not alone. I think that's it. <laughs> That's, that is plenty. That is so great. And I love to, you did say earlier, you said you were still in therapy or you had, did you say you're actively in therapy still? I am. Yes. And she's amazing. I'm so, so glad. Like, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about the blushing. She asked me questions about it. Um, you know, yes, we're, we yeah. talk about it. We're currently reshifting my thinking. Um, so that's tough. Um, that is tough, but it's, you know, it's it goes work. to show that you're, you're active in everything. You're active in your recovery. You're active in um, your blushing situation. And so even though people can look at you and say, well, Bailey overcame, she overcame, look at her, she overcame. But then I think it's huge when you say, and I'm in therapy because it's ongoing. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's ongoing. I don't think we ever just arrive. I think we will overcome a lot of different things, but then we'll, we'll discover something else that we're like, well, shoot. Yeah, I get that on my schedule to talk about, you know, so yes. I love that about you. You're very proactive in your healing. You're very proactive in taking control of your life and keeping it out there in the, in the front and center. Thank you so much for your time. I can't, I, I literally can't thank you enough. This has been such a sweet conversation and it's so, I love meeting people that I've been connecting with online. I know. I know. <laughs> so neat. Yes. Thank you so, so much neat. for setting this up. Like I'm, I'm very grateful and, you know, just sending all of my love. Thank you again. And Bailey, have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, April. Thank have you. a good one. I'm going to stay on here for just a second now that Bailey has hopped off because I thought that was so fantastic that even while we were talking, I'm so comfortable, calm in my system that I was flushing the whole time. And this is real life. I mean, and what's so funny about this is that it's not even that bad down through here. It just hit around this area. But it goes to show that it's not always about trying to figure out why it's happening or what could have been different in this environment. I don't really think there was anything different that could have happened. I, there's nothing in my mind that I could figure out is this happened this time because of this. And yes, I was drinking coffee. But if you watch the video with Dr. Tara, I was drinking coffee as well. And I was more hype and like ADHD and reaction to things. I felt a lot of energy in my body that day, a lot of excitement. It's not that I wasn't comfortable talking to her. It's that I was really excited about a lot of different things going on and just amped about that connection. Same thing with Bailey, really looking forward to meeting with her. But because I did my first interview with Dr. Tara, that was the first interview I've done in a long time since having, you know, being pregnant, having the baby. And then now meeting with Bailey, 
I got the interview out of the way. So I knew more what to experience after talking to Dr. Tara, but I felt so much more calm in my body talking to her. As soon as we showed up, I was more organized this time. I was more ready to go than I was last time with some of the things that had happened uh, prior to my meeting with Dr. Tara, I was having some computer issues. So everything lined up smoothly here. And yet I still flushed in this situation when I actually felt more calm and centered and prepared and everything else. So it just goes to show that, you know, Bailey's story is a fantastic example of we're all dealing with this in different ways. We all deal with different things in different ways and she's still showing up. And what I love about having her in real time as I started flushing, she acknowledged it when I talked about it and then we just moved on with the rest of the interview. And this hope is there for every single one of you. It is there for you and it is not easy. It's not easy to start. And I know that you might be listening to me and going, there's absolutely no way I could ever do what they're doing. But let me tell you, I didn't think I would be doing this. I did not think I would be flushing on camera for people to see and then carrying on. This is not how I imagined this. I always mention this. If you go back to my first video and you watch me confessing about my blushing experiences and how it makes me feel, I am small. I am so small in that, in that situation. My energy is gone. I am defeated and depleted and I'm desperate for help in that moment. And here we are almost two years later and I just feel so empowered by people like you people like Bailey who are showing up to tell their story about how they keep showing up. Her life is not perfect. Her history has not been perfect. And look at where she's at. And each one of us have that available to us, despite the fact that you may blush or flush or have any other skin condition going on. We want to connect with people who want to connect with us. We want to connect with people on that higher scale and that higher level, as Bailey said, not people who want to point at us and laugh at us and make us feel small. And I love what she said about take up space. So that I'm going to leave as an invitation from Bailey to me, to you, to all of us is be sure that you take up space. We can work through the rest of this, however we need to, but don't forget to take up space because you're worthy and because we need you. Thank you everybody for listening today. I will leave Bailey's information in the description box below. If you like this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. And as always, if you haven't subscribed, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. And remember, you are healing even if you still turn red. And even chronic blushers can still live their best life. See you in my next video.